If you've been a watch enthusiast for just a little bit of time, chances are you'll have had the conversation with someone about why JLC isn't more popular. This is the famous heritage brand which made movements for Patek, the brand that's known as the watchmaker's watchmaker. JLC is great, but also just in some ways seen as underperforming. What's up with JLC? Are they underperforming? And if so, why? Let's dive in. There are two questions. Is JLC underperforming? And if so, why? It's probably no big spoiler, but I do believe that JLC are underperforming. It is, after all, the base premise of this video, after all. I do think, though, that it's important to explain what I mean by underperforming, so we have a shared baseline for what I actually mean. First of all, JLC makes a little over 100,000 watches a year. That's more than double what AP makes. It's a fair bit more than Patek, Vacheron, Panerai, and Chopard. It's in the ballpark of numbers that a brand like IWC produces. That's definitely not nothing. On top of that, Richemont has for a whole lot of years in a row reported strong growth in their watch business portfolio. Towards the end of 2023, the numbers slowed quite significantly, but overall Richemont seems to indicate that their business in general, including JLC, are growing and profitable. If you look at the Morgan Stanley report, JLC is also just outside the top 10 best performing Swiss watch manufacturers. We're not dealing with a business that's going to go under. They're not poised to crash. And again, that's not the premise. The premise is not that they're failing, just that they are underperforming or they could be even better. The indications that we have that JLC are underperforming are partly factual and partly subjective on the part of the watch community. If we start with a subjective piece, I think it's fair to say that both the online watch community but also the press around JLC is usually colored by strong opinions about JLC's massive price hikes that have really hurt people's opinions of the brand. Most enthusiasts also kind of like them, but they are also met with a broader meh kind of attitude. Yeah, we like the Reverso, but for the amount of attention the Reverso gets versus the number of Reversos actually sold, there seems to be a bit of a disconnect. I mean, for the amount of time that gets talked about the Reverso compared to how many gets sold is not proportionate to how many times you talk about a Submariner and how often a Submariner gets sold. On the more objective side, JLC has consistently slipped in terms of position in the Morgan Stanley Watch Report. They used to be in the top 10 and have dropped every single year for several years in a row. Other brands have outpaced them both in terms of overall growth in numbers and also in terms of revenue per watch. A lot of other brands have succeeded in getting customers to spend more per watch and go for higher end watches. JLC just hasn't succeeded to the same extent that their competitors have. Objectively, JLC has done well, but a lot of other comparable brands have done so much better. Take a look at JLC's product portfolio and tell me what their strengths are commercially from a product lineup perspective. They've basically got three hero products. It's the Reverso, of course. It's the Polaris and it's complications. The Reverso is perpetually respected. It comes in a million different versions in terms of size, dial, configurations, complications, and materials. Whether you're a man, a woman, big or small, there's likely a Reverso out there for you. You can even customize it to your tastes with engraving and even enameling if that's something you appreciate. The Polaris is the JLC sports watch. Rolex has the Daytona. Zenith has the Chronomaster Sport. Vacheron has the integrated bracelet overseas. The Polaris is the watch that fills that dress sports watch space that today's consumers almost maniacally crave. Finally, JLC is also a complication brand. You get technically impressive models like the Reverso Dual Face Chronograph and also Perpetual Calendars, Tourbillons in the Reverso range and also in the Polaris and also varying master, master control ranges. So we can't say that JLC doesn't have hero products. They do. I also think JLC have two other strengths. I mentioned it before from a product perspective, but those movements in and of themselves are a significant strength. You can get a perpetual calendar from Frederic Constant, but when it comes down to design, finishing, and also technical innovation, JLC is usually quite special. Just like Glashütter or Langanzöhne, one of the things you'll hear JLC be praised for is how skilled they are at making great movements. Those movements also indicate another thing, value. This is a little bit controversial, I know, because we are more or less all in agreement that JLC's price hikes were exorbitant and unreasonable. Ask around, and most people would have said the old pricing was fair for what you got. And I do tend to agree. But in some ways, 
especially when it comes to techniques like lacquered dials, enameling, and movement finishing, there is a case to be made that you are getting a lot for your money from JLC, still to this day. The movements are maybe not Lange or Chopard level, but I don't think it's unfair to say that you could potentially charge much more for that kind of work that goes into making those JLC watches and movements. Which brings us to the problems, and there are more than enough of them. Again, the premise is not that they are a bad brand. The premise is they could be so much better. Remember that. Think of the top 10 most popular watches in the world right now. Not your 10 most favorite, but the 10 most popular in general. My guess is, depending on the price range you're in, you're mentioning a uh, Shooter Black Bay, Longines Spirit Zulu Time, a Nautilus, a Daytona, a Submariner, a Tissot PRX. Now limit yourself to watches from brands where the entry is above $10,000, $15,000. The picture is likely the same. Royal Oak, Nautilus, Antarctique, Lange One. What's the majority? Largely the most popular watches are sports style or dive style watches or integrated bracelets. What's not in the top 10? Dress watches. This is where we line up JLC products on my tool versus dress continuum. I put Rolex for reference because Rolex are experts at this. In general, Rolex inhabits and dominates that center left space where sporty dressy watches reside. These are the most popular types of watches in the world right now. And JLC, they have the Polaris and that's it. The Reverso, let's be honest, is not viewed as a sports watch, no matter how much JLC may try to convince us that it is. There's the Master, it's a dress watch. The Master Control, also a dress watch. Take a look at Glashütte Original, that price-wise are often in the ballpark of JLC. They have their dress watches as well, but overall their lineup leans far more sporty with the Specialist and the Vintage collections. On top of that, they have the Pano series. They do something aesthetically that is not as middle of the road as the Master or Master Ultra Thin collection. Next problem. Explain to a non-watch enthusiast the difference between a Master Ultra Thin and a Master Control. Clearly they're not identical. One is square, one is thin, and the last one is slightly more casual looking in terms of aesthetic. They are both dress watches. Throw the Reverso into the mix, that's a dress watch too. Overall, these watches are incredibly similar when considering how the market as such would react to them. I like referencing the code 1159 from AP despite all its perceived faults. The 1159 does one thing right, and that is cater to a completely different market and aesthetic compared to anything at all that comes out of the Royal Oak line. In the Royal Oak line, you also have a massive range from relatively restrained ultra thins to the beefy, chunky outdoor forward offshores, and then to the fashion forward concepts and collabs. You don't have to like all of them, but in terms of breadth, AP does this really well. JLC, on the other hand, has a conservative dress watch, a slightly less conservative dress watch, and a rectangular dress watch. They used to have a watch with a sector dial, which was still dressy, but far more sport forward and contemporary than anything else in their dress lineup. The Reverso is also a problem. For a JLC and Reverso lover, this is likely a statement that's going to rile you up. But think about Rolex for a moment. What comes to mind? Is it the Air King, the 1908? No, it's the Submariner, it's the GMT, it's the Datejust. Whatever comes to mind when thinking of Rolex or Longines or AP is likely going to be the model that the brand puts front and center in terms of positioning. But it's also a very attractive watch from a market perspective. The Reverso, no doubt, popular, but realistically it's the Polaris that speaks most to the trends of the market. The Reverso sells a lot. I think it sells a ton to women. It sells to JLC enthusiasts, but I'm not convinced it's as popular with the random new watch buyer, even in the high-end segment. Last year, I remember the releases of the JLC Reverso Chrono, the Polaris Chronos with new enamel dials, and a slew of other Reversos. I couldn't tell you what happened in the other lines in terms of updates. Any person going in to buy a rectangular watch has to first get out of their head that a watch should be round. So I do think that in some ways it's a problem that a relatively niche aesthetic like the Reverso is so often front and center in terms of marketing and attention. The Polaris is also a problem. The Polaris Chrono retails for $14,300. That's give or take about the same as the Daytona. Now, which one are you choosing? Well, a majority, if they could get past the waiting list, would choose the Daytona. Polaris over a Speedmaster Ed White? I think most people would choose the Ed White. 
Royal Oak Krona, yeah, it's more expensive, but still the majority are going for the Royal Oak. How about the Polaris Date Super Compressor? How often is that watch getting chosen over a Submariner style watch or a Planet Ocean or any other watch that has an external dive bezel? Dual crown super compressors are again niche and don't necessarily cater to a broad audience. For the Polaris models, there's either for the consumer a mental hurdle in terms of choosing something as almost esoteric as an internal dive bezel diver, or on paper, a sports chrono in a market dominated by icons like the Daytona, the Royal Oak, and the Speedmaster. It's a good watch. I like a lot of the models, but for the regular watch buyer, it doesn't have the kind of recognizability a Submariner Omega Seamaster 300M or Nautilus has. I've even mentioned the concept of boardroom watches before. Watches designed purely to address a certain market segment. And the Polaris isn't quite that. It has, after all, been around since the 1960s, but it is currently in the lineup to address a gap in the JLC line. And it's good, but it's just not that good compared to the competition out there. The next question I find myself asking is, are JLC too cheap or too expensive? I did a video about how JLC's price increases were totally off and how it likely hurt them. So you would think the answer was easy, but here's the thing. What do people say when they talk about JLC? They say it's the watchmaker's watchmaker. They say that JLC delivered movements to Patek and other high-end brands. They say that the finishing and movements are far better than anything you find in a Rolex. They say enameling. They say lacquered dials. They say complications. A lot of what gets said about JLC is what you say about Patek or Chapek or Chopard. And then you look at the numbers from the Morgan Stanley report. The average revenue per Patek sold is three times higher than that of Rolex. Hublot is 50 to 60% higher per watch than a Rolex. Vacheron, Blancpain, Breguet are all over Rolex. The average revenue per watch sold for JLC is less than Rolex. Doesn't this seem intuitively wrong to you? AP and Patek make their money largely not by selling their entry watches, but rather by having a strong following of buyers that buy the specialty products, the gold watches, the high complications, the limited editions. Clearly, this isn't happening to the same extent with JLC. People are buying in the lower end. I'm certain there are a lot of female buyers of JLC, and they're buying the entry reversos. Compared to Patek or AP or somebody similar, customers don't find the upgrade path to JLC's upscale models compelling. They buy the entry reverso, they buy a basic steel master ultra thin, not a gold perpetual calendar Polaris or gold moon face. All of this is to say that considering how JLC position themselves in the way they talk about their technical prowess, their superior finishing, their complications, people are by and large choosing to buy the cheaper stuff despite having many high end offerings. Hublot excels at this. People happily upgrade to a gold version of the classic fusion. Hublot can convince people to pay big bucks for a Unico model, but when people walk into the JLC store, they do not walk out with that tourbillon. They leave with a basic reverso. Otherwise, the average retail price would not be lower than Rolex. For a luxury position brand, I think that's a problem. I was a little bit on the fence for problem number six, but it's online sales. JLC makes most models available online for direct-to-consumer sales. There are a whole lot of strengths to this. More profit margin, better control of your product. You can buy a Tesla online. You can buy Longines, Cartier, and a whole lot of other brands online. But you can't buy Tudor, you can't buy Rolex, you can't buy Patek, you can't buy Chapek. Generally speaking, the more high-end brands do not have online sales channels. This could be because they are slower to adapt to changing consumer behavior, but it could also be because luxury products and luxury customers expect a different experience. Deloitte ended up pushing me off the fence with their 2023 watch report. It's clear. People buy online because it's convenient, because of the selection and because of availability. The manufacturers, though, are also clear. They see that the physical store builds a personal relationship. You get to feel the watch. You get to experience the luxury. You don't buy a high-end Porsche online from Porsche. You don't buy a Bentley or Rolls either. You can configure them online, but at some point you need to talk to someone who guides you through the sales experience. I'm just not convinced that JLC selling their models online is a good thing, depending on where specifically they think they should be in terms of consumer demographic. The more high-end they see themselves, the less I think it makes sense. JLC is the watchmaker's watchmaker. Everybody rants about their skills in terms of movements and complications. But honestly, who has a stranglehold on movements and complications? 
It's Patek for complications, it's Lange for finishing. If you follow the way JLC market themselves, there is a lot of focus on technique. Videos of enameling complications, and I just don't think it sells. Patek don't even lean so much into the complications as such as you would think. They lean into that they're just the best or exclusive. Technique isn't their selling point. Hublot has lots of technique as well, but the selling point is pure popularity. The few brands that go all in on technique are brands like MBNF, and even they lean more into the creativity and uniqueness of their products. JLC even touts their skills at customization with personal engraving and enameling to order. That's incredibly niche and it's admirable and it's impressive. But for a brand that sells one tenth of what Rolex sells and on average makes less per watch than Rolex, that kind of niche product offering is potentially a little bit misplaced. Final problem. I made a video, link up here, about how luxury, true high-end luxury, so, you know, well above Rolex needs massive differentiation. At the low end and mid end of watches, brands tend to look a lot more like each other. Omega has their broadly appealing dive watch, so does Rolex. Tudor has their broadly appealing sports watch, so does Longines, so does Nomos. But take Shapek, Vacheron, AP and Patek. There are commonalities, but generally speaking, there's a much greater level of differentiation. AP is all about extreme collabs with their integrated sports watch. Blancpain is almost the only luxury watchmaker that has a fairly straightforward dive watch in their lineup. Lange basically challenges you to wear your watches upside down because it's all about the elaborate movements. MBNF, Chopard, likewise. The overlaps are just smaller. The differentiation, the positioning is greater. And then you have JLC. The Master series is an excellent but fundamentally bland dress watch. The complications are fairly simple upgrades to those simple dress watches. They're good watches, but apart from a select few models, most of them have a superior competitor offering out there. I would choose a Calatrava over a Master Ultra Thin. I would choose a Daytona over a Polaris. I would choose a Lange over a Duometer. JLC just doesn't quite stand out. That's my contention. So how do we fix that? Well, JLC has two paths it can go. Option one is sell more watches. This is likely the most difficult path for JLC. If they want to sell more watches, the numbers game would need them to overhaul their product lineup massively and change their marketing. JLC is not going to sell half a million watches or even 300,000 like Tudor by pushing reversos and dress watches in the master line. JLC would likely need to pivot away from those dress watches and into far more sporty offerings. Just like Nomos that built the Nomos Club Sport to take the popular but niche Nomos Club and place it squarely in the sports watch segment. JLC would need that entry sports watch. They would also need to lower prices and pivot away from custom enameling, which although cool is not useful if you're going to play the numbers game. The technical prowess that JLC show would need to take a backseat to luxury lifestyle watches with a twist. This path though also means you start competing directly with Rolex, Omega and a ton of others. The competition is cutthroat and all indications are that the real money is upscale in the luxury segment. So option one is not the path they would take. Option two would be, in my opinion, to sell more expensive watches. And I think to a certain extent, this is also the path JLC is trying to take. I think they have some level of analysis that comes to some of the same conclusions that I have. Why do I think this? Well, because they've raised their prices by 30, 40%. JLC, I think, knows and they want to go more high end and they want to put distance between themselves and that upper mid range riffraff of your regular Rolex buyer. But raising prices alone is not going to cut it. It just angers consumers and it doesn't fundamentally change buyer behavior or buyer perception. This is where we've got one last major comparison coming in. Consider again Rolex or Omega and their lineup. How's it built up? It's essentially built like a pyramid. You have a large assortment of options at the entry level, a steel sub, a steel GMT, a steel OP, a steel Rolex Explorer. From there, you have upgrade paths to more exclusive models in terms of materials, primarily for Rolex. For Omega, complications get thrown in the mix, but the semi-pyramid kind of structure is there. The volume comes from the base. JLC is very similar to these brands. You've got lots of entry reversos in steel. You've got lots of entry masters in steel got master controls in steel and even $10,000 entry Polaris models in steel. Now look at Patek or Lange. Okay, they have the Calatrava and the Saxonia. 
But how many options do they have in steel? How many entry options do they have at all? Their product lineup doesn't have that pyramid kind of shape. Not only that, but their most desirable, most talked about models are not necessarily the entry models. JLC still has this pyramid type shape and I think potentially this will hold them back. Having so many, relatively speaking, affordable options is not conducive to pushing people up the funnel. They just happily stay at the bottom of the pyramid. I would be fine with JLC having a master ultra thin date in steel, but why also offer the moon phase in steel? Phase it out and keep only the gold version. Same for the steel power reserve model. Make it exclusive. If you want the power reserve, you have to upgrade to gold. Remove a lot of the steel models and have only the gold models. If you as a customer want the complication, you have to pay the precious metal premium. Get rid of that pyramid approach. JLC would need to address their marketing, not pivoting away from their very technical positioning, but by making their complications price-wise more exclusive, they would add credence to the fact that they are something special. The reverser, of course I'd keep it, but imagine again a little bit more focus and not as much of a pyramid lineup. Now if they do everything that I'm thinking, what would they have? Well, they'd have a slightly cheaper Vacheron Constantin. Realistically, JLC isn't poised to take on the likes of AP Chapek or Patek, but Vacheron? Think about it. The 56 has a lot of what the Master Control has. It's a youth and sport forward dress watch. The Patrimony aligns somewhere near the Master Ultra Thins, the Overseas versus the Polaris. JLC has, relatively speaking, a lot in common with Vacheron. Now, I stand by my assertion that in the real high end, differentiation is also hugely important. And I do think that that's also part of Vacheron's problems. They're just not particularly differentiated in terms of products and positioning. But could JLC with a few adjustments challenge Vacheron for their spot? JLC is not doing badly by any stretch of the imagination, but they are such a good and historically important brand that I do think they could do so much better than they are doing. JLC are kind of in this no man's land. The pricing is similar to mass market offerings like Rolex, but they're only doing niche numbers like Patek and AP. JLC, I think personally, could do well to pick a path more clearly. The path I see is not volume growth, and I don't think they see that either, but average revenue per watch growth. I think that JLC are good enough to be able to move their customers upwards in the product lineup, not just by raising prices, but by convincing buyers to buy the more high-end offerings. They would need some lineup changes. They're not hugely differentiated, but tell me you wouldn't at least be open to considering a master ultra thin moon phase in gold over a 56 moon phase calendar. Throw on a steel bracelet on a master control and you have a relatively decent high end sports watch that isn't quite Lange and Zerner Odysseus level, but it could potentially be quite compelling. JLC could be so much more if they wanted to. That's what I think at least. I've overthought it, I know, but that's Part of the fun. So what do you think? How would you feel if JLC became even more exclusive? Would that be in keeping with how you see JLC historically? Let me know in the comments. Like, subscribe. Cheers.